kill a girlfriend. Well, Mums has been hanging in here. It's almost like, you know, when, when kids go camping or wherever, they go away and uh, they all start claiming their room. <laughs> I think she's claimed her room. Haven't you, Mums? Yeah, you're just waiting for your, your chips to get put in and your, and your stall wall and your mirror and your makeup and shit, right? Hey, okay. Mums? Anyway, I got lots to share. No sleep last night, so this morning's plans of hitting that secret steelhead pool and filming those suckers underwater got squawked. And then I was woken up by all hell breaking loose in the in the hen in the hen uh, coop over there. I thought a big cat was in there, so there I am running around in my underwear with a rifle at work at two in the morning. Nothing there. And then uh, then what happened? Then we got a call from the post office at quarter after five or five thirty to come and pick up our meat kings and our turkey chicks peep peeps you can hear them in the background maybe i'll show you guys them after this i got a gopro on the ground in there by request of sarah to videotape them doing their thing at the feeder and uh so i got time to be here for a bit now so i'm getting out more shares before i leave for a few days so let's see what we got Sasquatch destroyed physical evidence. Steve, just wanted to email my possible encounter for you to possibly share in your channel. I'll, help, I'll cut right to the chase. Perfect. That's what we need. I'm 36 now. This happened in the early 2000s. I remember not being quite old enough to drive yet. It was May, and my father, cousin, and I were on a spring turkey hunt not far from home where we live in New York. The region is referred to as the Hudson Valley. It's nice, quiet, full of hiking trails. Was to hunt in streams and lakes to fish. Anyway, the three of us were in a spot where my father and I loved going because I missed a monster tom that had been my first bird when I was younger. The place had a lot of game and big birds. We loaded up and headed into the woods on an old logging road. No birds were talking. No deer seen at the field with clover patches. It seemed weird not to see a deer, but we kept going, stopping every few minutes to call and listen. I'd say a good three quarters of a mile on the logging road, we were coming up to the power lines that ran down the mountain and before we got to the bend in the logging road, a dank, musky smell hit us that you could taste in the back of your throat and made our eyes water. My dad said it was a bear, so that's what we went with. He had come to the power line clearing after the going around the bend. From woodline to woodline, it was about a good 30 to 40 yards, could have been more, but the grass was high. If memory serves me right, I'd say shin level. As we slowly moved to get in the cover of the woods again, my cousin noticed footprints in the grass. He had size 11 on his boot. He had size 11 and his boot was swimming in these prints. I remember him trying to walk into prints and match the stride, but he wasn't even close. He was six foot two. Oddly enough, we never put two and two together. My father said it must be a guy with a huge pair of hunting boots. Not even in a joking way did someone say, I bet it's Bigfoot. It just wasn't even a thought. I don't know if you're familiar with the regulations for spring turkey hunting in New York State, but it ends at noon. So we were out of the woods by noon without hearing a bird. Now here's the weird part. It was like three or four days later. My father and I figured we would try our luck there again as the last resort for the day. It was maybe 10 a.m. We get there, load up, and walk the logging road. Some results, no animals. No gobbling in the distance. We bend the turn, coming up to the power line clearing, and my dad just stopped. I thought he saw a bird in the clearing and asked, what do you see? And all he could do was say, huh? With his head cocked, trying to piece this strange sight together. I get alongside him and I notice that the area where the foot tracks in the grass were, all the grass from woodline to woodline is ripped up. Some areas the ground was ripped up with the grass. Other spots it was ripped up real low to the ground. It was all uneven on the grass that was ripped out, just thrown all over like green confetti. I asked my father who or what would do that. And he thought it had, had to do with these footprints and said, it rained the other day. Skunks and popsins must have been digging for worms. And to be honest with you, Steve, I 100% believed him. I didn't question it. He then said, it's obvious the turkeys aren't here anymore and the coyotes must have got them. And we left right after. Years and years later, I came to realize that more than likely was not a bear that smelled like that. 
These prints weren't from a hunter with a huge boot, and possums and skunks don't clear out a huge area of grass while digging for worms. I tried asking my dad about the day he about that day, he said he only remembers the smelly bear. Don't remember the grass being ripped up. And my cousin and I don't really talk anymore, but if I run into him, it's been on my mind to ask him his thoughts and what happened. Well, that's my experience. I hope you and the viewers enjoy it. Enjoy it if you happen to read it. I love your book. You cannot wait for more to come. Stay, stay safe out there. Oh, and you can say my name. I don't care. I know what I experienced. I know these things exist. Sincerely, Andrew Jones. Andrew, appreciate that. Thanks for that share, man. I've been in upstate New York, seen a pile of turkeys up there, but I've never hunted in that state for turkey. I've hunted turkey in numerous states, and I've experienced the shut it down at, new rule, at noon rules. Noon, one o'clock as well, I think. But that's different. I don't think we've heard a flavor of that yet, but it doesn't surprise me. Nothing actually surprises me, really. Any moms? Nothing surprises any of us anymore, All right? Thanks for sending that in. No subject. Thank you for giving people a voice. I've been following your channel for some time. From our fish hut being raided to traps around our burn pit, I totally understand what is out there. They've been in the back of my mind from the age of nine. My father always told me that he would explain the what goes bump in the night when I get older. Due to his sudden departure, cancer, it's like I'm missing a part of my life. That's ah, just a shitty deal, man. I'm not the hunter like my brother. Mind you, I always have a firearm within reach when I'm there. I was 10 or 11 when he started to believe, when I started to believe that we weren't alone out there. Our place of 45 acres is near Kirkland Lake, Ontario. I can't remember my exact age, but I know it was before I had hair on my pills. I was in a swamp gathering meadow traps when I had an experience that I kept to myself due to the fact that when I told someone, I was ridiculed. I was out in the flat bottom 25 to 35 yards from shore when I jumped out of my skin due to whatever it was that hit the water less than a few feet from me. So there I am waist deep in a swamp when the splash that made me feel like a dump truck just fell from the sky made me make number two in my pants. Yes, pants due to the leeches. My brother has X amount of trail cameras all over the game trails and he has never seen anything to show me. Mind you, it might be because he thinks it might scare me of all the things I love in the wild of nature. He does always make me prove that I'm confident with a firearm and now I think I know why. I haven't seen them directly so I can't say I haven't seen but like I said from the traps around our burn pit and the rear that has been ripped off the windows and doors of our fillet hut I can only understand why people are intimidated to speak of the topic. My father has been gone for over 10 years so I, can, I can't ask him why he welded rebar onto the windows and the door in the game cleaning hut. My brother has more trail cams than I know of and he tells me he has never picked up a picture that he can't explain. I wish dad was still there to finish the what goes bump in the night chat. Thank you for helping me by having someone to tell. Hey! Hey! He's digging in the garbage. I'm not going to have Thanks for that share, man. You know what it was. And you don't have to worry about anybody uh, ridiculing you anymore, all right? Just don't worry about it anymore. The truth's out, the cat's out of the bag, and all those people who think they're going to prove Sasquatch exists aren't even in the parking lot, let alone the game. It's been proven a long time ago. Done deal. It's been done. Now, it's... If you, if you can manage to help yourself escape that circle of endless, endless circle of direction by thinking you're going to prove the existence of Sasquatch, then you're probably not going to go much very far. What the questions you need to seek the answers to now is why? <laughs> why are we not informed officially? Why are we not informed and educated as young children? Why are rural communities not absolutely informed? Why, why, why? Okay? Skip the part where you think you have to prove it. That's what the people who are misleading us, or whoever it is who is misleading us, and putting down such a huge effort to keep this topic suppressed, that's where they want everybody. They want everybody going in a circle. 
It's harmless. It's perfect. Keep everybody going in a circle. Engage people and ask them for proof. Stop them dead in their tracks from advancing by doing that. And everything's going to be just fine for the people or groups who don't want the general public to know officially, right? So please, <laughs> if you're one of those numerous people out there who think you are dedicating your life to proving to the world that Sasquatch exists, it's been done, okay? And you are stuck in that circle where numerous people want you to be stuck. Prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. We gotta, we gotta find out why. Why, why, why? Now, what do we got? Please don't use my name, not for me, but for my ex-girlfriend. I'll keep it short and simple. We're camping in the Ozarks about 2.30 or 3 a.m. We heard something walking around our camp. We waited until sundown. We waited, we waited until dawn, sorry, and decided to leave. What I saw next has bothered me for 30 years. It was in the tree line about 30 yards away. It squatted down, covered its face, and vanished. There you go. And you know what? It has troubled every single person who's seen these damn things. It's troubled. And it's been on their minds nonstop. And you can't shake it. And uh, as an example of that, how long have I I've known about the I've known of these things being fact for since around 1985. I think that's around when I had my, yeah, 84, 85, 85 for sure is 85. That's how long I've known. And to be honest, I am getting creeping up real close on my time to go up north. And like I said previously at home, while I'm at home, it's on my mind a lot. I'm nonstop. I, I'll catch myself daydreaming as I'm working back here doing what I'm doing. And I will catch myself, I can't really say stressing, or I'm just more concerned and I'm thinking a lot more, I'm having thoughts to myself a lot more of, I wonder what's gonna happen this year, or is something gonna happen this year? And I'm thinking, I hope nothing happens as I'm leading up to going. But like I said, in much time, as soon as I get in the woods and everything's cool and I'm focused on what my task at hand and I'm good, but it's always before I go when I'm at home, when I got time to sit and daydream and picture where I'm going, I'll be alone. And uh, I picture and remember every single experience that all of my friends up north have had. Guide friends, outfitter friends, trapper friends. Hundreds of people email me in here today. All have had experiences in all the places that I will be traveling to in the next 30 some odd days. But I'm just saying that for you, it's been plagued you for 30 years. Same. Every one of us. You're not alone. You're in the club of no return. You didn't ask for it, but you're here with us. And you're safe. Now, safe for ridicule here anyway. Pretty dusty up there. You guys look like you're on a fire. Yeah. All right. Little interruption there. Let's get back into it. Marcus Red, New England Sasquatch Marine Veteran. Good day, Steve. I wrote you before, but realized my email might have been kind of vague. My name is Paul Perry. Use my name. I'm 31 from Massachusetts. I grew up in Abbott Outdoorsman, fishing, hunting, camping, etc. To give you a little background, in 2008, I left the Marines. I was 18, and the war on terror was in full swing. After two deployments and a Purple Heart, I came home due to wounds sustained in Afghanistan and couldn't re-enlist. So in January 2012, I moved back home. I basically jumped back into the outdoors life and rekindling a relationship I had prior to leaving, I started hiking with my now wife for 13 years. My experience was the late summer 2013. I took my wife hiking up the Freetown State Forest, known as the Bridgewater Triangle to locals. We've heard this name. We started out late in the afternoon, so it got dark quick. As darkness fell, we all we got almost. As darkness fell, we got lost, almost circling the same areas. This is where my experience is different than most. <laughs> There's no crunching, no tree snaps. There was silence. See, I don't even know what made me look other than the sixth sense. Right. But I looked. 
through the moonlit trees and seeing the silhouette of a giant figure running through the trees. So you have been shot. I know what it's like to accept death and have a mindset that I'm going to die. This trumped that tenfold. This figure could have been more than 75 yards in closing. Which means I should have heard it. As a Marine, I'm trained to shoot 500 yard iron sights. I have a good judge of yardage. And this was close to 75 yards and paralleling us. I drew my sidearm and grabbed my wife by the back of her neck and pushed her through her th th pushed her through prickle bushes and made our way, made our own path until I seen a light on the house on until I seen a light on a house and came to it in someone's backyard, firearms still drawn. I didn't feel safe. So I was on the pavement of a street well lit up by street lights. Thankfully she's seen what I'd seen, but I can't explain. Seven to eight feet being running. Seven to eight foot being running, clearing distances no man could clear in such a short time. What was creepy was there was a silence over the woods, including that being running. That day scared the shit out of me. I would re deploy to Afghanistan twice a year over rather than see what I saw that day. Have you ever heard of these beings having encounters where it was silence? It's been nine years of and that replays in my head daily, almost trying to figure out daily almost trying to figure out what the F I seen. Paul, thanks for saying that man. And uh first job. I'm, I'm guessing that you are absolutely frustrated right now what's going on over there in Afghanistan after what you and many other people from numerous countries sacrificed for reasons I haven't a clue why over there. It's frustrating times, man. The Western leadership is embarrassing. I saw a town meeting where our pickle is put in the position of Prime Minister of Canada. It was actually a town meeting with a Canadian veteran who lost his limbs. Uh, before he was elected, re-elected, whatever it was, the little munchkin said, uh, promised everybody they'd be taking care of our veterans, which as far as I'm concerned, should be the number one priority with our tax dollars first. That's just me. And uh, the veteran was in that room and asked him flat out, you know, look at me, look at me. You promised you were going to do this and this and that first, you haven't done anything, what's up? And that little prick looked that man square in the eye and said, um, uh, Canada does not have enough money, extra money for you right now. He said that. I swear on my life, if I was in that room, I would have stormed that podium like a rabid dog and done anything I could to get a piece of that little prayer. Anyway, sorry about the little rent. The times are challenging right now across the board in our planet. What's going on today? What's going on with people who take 65% of our income from us? Plus, and I just had to get a little spiel up now that I've heard from someone who was actually over there in Afghanistan and been wounded. And you're not the first person to write in. And you're not, as well, you're not the first person to write in about the terror being far worse than combat. It's like I said every time, it's amazing skill that is to impose such fear on brave people. Brave, armed people. Isn't that crazy? No doubt you relive that in your mind every day. We all do. We all. I mean, I, obviously I can't avoid it now. I get emailed every single day about the topic, but even besides that point, every single time I drive out to my boat, every single time I go deer hunting at home where I was previously living, every single time I drive any highway in British Columbia, I'm thinking about them. I'm gazing in the mountains and the forests, and I'm thinking about them. You can't, you can't not after you've seen them. You can't. And then you come across some half-brained dead idiot who laughs. <laughs> laughs at you for what you saw and what you didn't ask to see. Anyway, I guess reality TV needs those people to, to stay on the air, right? And there's no shortage of reality TV on the air. So there you go. Anyway, enough about me babbling. Thanks again for sending that in, man. And I know for sure you are getting some kind of relief from listening to all these fellow honest human beings share their encounters here and share them with you to hear as well, right? Holy cow, I just had to tap out for a few minutes. You know, usually, 90% of the time, the emails that come in are people that are troubled, they're troubled what they saw, they want to share what they saw, what happened to them and how it affected them, and or plus knowledge they gained from their experience, right? And that's great, that's what we're after. But then every once in a while you get somebody who wants me to tell me 
basically their entire life story. And I'm not being sarcastic, I'm being serious. They do that. And I mean, out of respect for every single person that writes in, I'll start reading that email and I start reading them in front of that camera, that thing recording. So it's all time, right? And a lot of you say, well, you proofread, it, proofread them before you read them here. Well, because that's double time, all right? So what happens is I'll read, 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 then if I figure out something absolutely waste of time, there's a lot of people out there who are a little off in any population of any country and on this planet, right? It's just the way it is. Sometimes you run into them. And then I'll have to filter that out, kick to the curb, and keep going forward. Sometimes I'll get four or five or six emails smooth all the way through. Perfect. No editing. Great. Knowledge, knowledgeable emails or emails where people need the support from all of you. Perfect. And then the odd time I'll get one that is a novel and very little substance to it. Just a lot of history about the person and their whole life. And I just got suckered by two of those in a row. Which means I basically stood in front of this damn camera with it hit and record while I wanted to be getting ready to leave. And then uh, altogether I lost the same amount of time it would be to do an entire video for all you guys and all you other people who are waiting to be heard. And uh, it really sucks the life out of you. I had to tap out and go. I just had to walk away. Now it's getting hot in the shop, but also I didn't have much sleep last night, so maybe that's out of my impatience, but yeah, I'm babbling. So I did salvage a handful of stories from that little session in the barn. And uh, we will uh, add some more to it right now before I leave. And then I'll be back shortly in finishing up the barn and uh, editing up what I film all the way and getting it out there, keeping the ball rolling. Not that you haven't noticed yet, but this isn't going to stop. There's nothing to stop it. A little, little bit of bright reflection up there on me, so I got to use my broom in the hand. All right, here's a. This is marked as a question. All right, here we go. Don't know if you ever read my account or not. First, I just want to thank you for what you're doing. The reason for this email is to just ask a question about how one feels after the encounter. Myself, I seem to think about my encounter at least once or twice a day. I've also become very aware of my surroundings, especially outside at night. Sometimes in the evenings in my kitchen making a cup of coffee, I'll look out the window into the darkness and just feel uncomfortable. It's strange. When I go somewhere in the car as a passenger, I find myself watching the woods. I'm not afraid, just very curious if they're closer to us than I would realize. So I guess my question is, do you ever get over the feeling of them? It's been since November 2019, since my encounter, and it's like it was last night. Thanks again, sir. Stay safe. And yes, you can use my name, Jack Smith. Jack, welcome to the club and no return. And uh, speaking as a fellow member of that club, right in ask for this ship. Um, no, you don't ever stop thinking about it. Every single time you take a drive on a rural country road or a highway across country, you think about them. You wonder if they're there. You wonder if they're up there. You wonder if they're ahead or behind you. You wonder if they're around the mountains you're looking at in the distance. And I can almost guarantee without, without asking that 99.999% of everybody who's had this experience feels exactly the same. Thanks for writing in, Jack. The knowledge my father gave me. Mark, this is red. Dear Steve, first I'd like to thank you so much for giving a platform for people to tell their stories and feel vindicated. Steve, please only use my first name, Tim. Thank you again. Steve, I've been wanting to write to you for quite a while, and I watch you regularly on, YouTube, on your YouTube videos. I've tried many times to write this story to you, but it's extremely long. I'm going to do my best to shorten it. Maybe I'll just have to send you another email. So here it goes. I often hear my father speak of a creature in the woods and warn my brothers when they were going hunting to be careful of the booger. So let me give you some background information on my father. My father was a Cherokee Indian. He grew up with his siblings and mother on the reservation in Topeka, Kansas, where he was 21 years old. He, when he was 21 years old, he left the reservation and joined the military to go fight in the Korean War. When he came home from the war, he met my mother, married, and had nine children. Wow. He never went back to the reservation, and at times his brothers would come to visit him. So let me get back to the story. One day my father and I were sitting on the porch, and I asked him, what? was this creature that he was speaking about. 
He became very serious and told me to listen very carefully to what he's about to say. There are several different types of species of this creature. One comes from the lineage of Cain, another from the fallen angels. He talked about a time not too long ago when the bear people went to war with the Sasquatch. The bear people were part bear, part human, part demon. The Sasquatch killed just about all of the bear people and what were remaining fled from the Rocky Mountains. He said they are all extremely strong and run at phenomenal speed. He said they, the different tribes had different traits and different abilities, but that at one time we also humans had these abilities, but for some reason were steered away from them. And now there are only a few left who are able to use these abilities. He said that these creatures of Sasquatch were able to mimic any animal, human, machine, vehicle, trailer, truck, chainsaw, and boat. They also could mimic wind, rain, and thunder. He talked about how the Sasquatch from the, from the lineage of Cain lived in caves and nesting areas. How the ones that came from the lineage of the fallen ones live underground. He told me of how the star people would come and take the male Sasquatch when they reached a certain age, sometimes returning them, sometimes never to be seen again. He told me many things, Steve, but this email is already quite long, so I'll do my best to send you another email detailing more information about the different species. Thank you. Again, thank you, and I'm very sorry to hear about macaroni. All right, Tammy, it sounds interesting. Also, what sounds interesting to me I'm curious about is an Aboriginal person referring to the Bible when it comes to the history of these beings. That's a little surprising to me. But I'm looking forward to it. If you want to email more, share more, send it away. We're here. Steve, yeah, how long is this one? All right, one more. Steve, I feel like you're my brother from another mother. You're such a great guy. I love and respect you. Okay, so here's my third encounter. Thanks for the kind words. Doing some rock climbing in Tulum Meadows, Yosemite, MP, 2017. Pronounced Tu Wal Um Ni. Tu Wal Um Ni. <laughs> How's that? Every afternoon, a herd of deer with yearlings crossed the Lee Vining Creek right next to the camps that I was staying at. I watched them. They crossed the creek at the exact same spot, same time, like clockwork. It's a shallow riffle at their crossing spot. There's a huge grove in the creek bank on both sides. Okay, so one evening after dark, and it is pitch black, I have to take a leak. As I'm peeing almost simultaneously, I hear what sounds like rocks clacking together. Stupid loud. And the local herd of deer come crashing across the creek in a deep pool. That's so effing crazy. They're bumping into one another. They're struggling in four feet of water, and their eyes are bulging out. I mean, anyone can tell they were scared and running for their lives. They almost, they almost made physical contact with me. Crazy, right? I think they were being hunted and ran toward the light of my headlamp to cut off the pursuit of savvy beings in the hunt. I had a feeling that a predator was near. I felt nauseous, but not like I was the hunted. It was so hard to verbalize the experience, but I know without a doubt, they, those beings are everywhere. To have encounters in North New York, Colorado, and California, to me, confirm this. I've got another encounter in the Trinity Alps of Northern California that I'll share at a future date. I believe these beings are at some loss as we are as to how to respond to us when our worlds collide. Share the info, share the truth. We all learn and grow together in awareness and understanding. When we share the reality of our encounters, live free or die, my friends. I choose to thrive, not merely survive. Keep the faith, Brother Steve. It would be really cool to meet you someday. Hang in there. Sincere regards, Steve Durgo, Springwater, New York. Thanks for that, Steve. That would be a pretty alarming encounter. I've had experienced deer jumping in the water beside me and standing on the same sandbar as me while I'm fishing, looking back in the forest, panting. That was after I was aware of these beings, so I definitely had some anxious moments there. <laughs> I'm hoping it wasn't going to come, come stomping out and stand there on the side of my sandbar and rip the head out the deer in front of me or something. The worst. But anyway. I gotta get some stuff together, my camera equipment together, pack my bag and get going. If I got time, I'm gonna make one more video creation out of everybody's shares to get these voices heard before I go. And then I'll be back with a whole pile of new stuff.